Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'd like to talk to you about disturbances, uh, especially as they relate to community structure. Now, a disturbance, you know, when you, you hear that word disturbance, it kind of has a, a bit of a negative connotation. And, you know, the truth is, when a community is disturbed, it can be detrimental, but as it turns out, sometimes disturbances can actually be beneficial for the ecosystem and the community. How about that? And so let's look into this conversation. And so what I want to say about disturbance, disturbances is that they affect the structure of, of the community. And as you can see, what was the disturbance here? It looks like there was a fire. That's an example of a disturbance that can come into a community and, and alter it. And you can consider things like, for example, like how, how quickly can a community recover from a disturbance? And so that this is a measure of the community's stability uh, to whether or not it's going to be able to persist in the face of, of a disturbance. And again, you know, it depends. It depends on the, the level of the, diverse, of the disturbance. And so we're going to sort of consider uh, a low disturbance, an intermediate disturbance, and a major disturbance. And so these are the things that we want to consider and how uh, communities handle that. And so what are some examples other than fire? Well, weather in, in general can be a disturbance. Uh, it, for example, even things like rain, if it, if it rains for a prolonged period of time, or if snow uh, can be, or a drought could be a disturbance to an area. And, and again, of course, humans can provide sort of an unnatural disturbance that can alter a community. And, you know, some of these are routine. Uh, fires are often periodical, meaning that they're, they're caused by lightning strikes, uh, or th there's dry seasons which really promote fire to come to an area. And again, these things may not be harmful. Like, for example, when fire comes and it, and it burns down grass, what it does this grass is really, you know, an annual, which means that it's only going to live for a year anyway. And what that does is it, it brings those nutrients that were in the grass back into the soil, which makes it um, able for the next generation to come in and thrive. And so it's, it's really important, fire might say, that, that kind of disturbance. But sometimes human activities, again, you might imagine what humans do to disturb communities are often harmful. And we'll get into that a little bit later give some examples of that. You might be thinking of what some of those might be as we talk about this. How do we know that fire, since, you know, we we look at things like as a human uh, sort of short term, because we don't live very long, but when you look at um, evidence back in nature, like for example, fire scars and, and tree cross sections, you could see that there's sort of a, a period of time. Now it could fluctuate, but there's basically fire is predictable. It comes in and it, it's, it's able to uh, burn in a particular community. Now, you might think that a forest, you know, right on the, on, the, on, on the surface, you might think a forest is afraid of fire, but if fire is natural, and it is, and if it, occur, it occurs periodically, and, and it's fairly routine, you could appreciate the fact that the organisms that live in that area are adapted to fire, and they might actually come to need it in order to survive and thrive. And in fact, they do. So fire is not altogether harmful. It helps uh, trees to be able to reproduce. It helps to eliminate competitive vegetation so that the new uh, seeds are able to grow uh, with lots of light. And again, the, the fire returns nutrients into the soil, which is pretty beneficial. You're like, well, why doesn't it burn down all the trees? Well, some of the trees are adapted to fire because they have their, their foliage is pretty high up or they have a thick bark. Uh, or maybe what happens is the seeds themselves are actually very thick, the coat. And so therefore, you need a fire treatment in order to wear down the seed coat so that, that then, only after fire, the seeds are, be, are able to take in water, which is called imbibe, to imbibe water, and therefore they're able to germinate only after a fire. Uh -huh. Interesting. So, you know, the marine community, which often we forget because we're terrestrial and we think everything's on the land, but in fact, 75% of the earth is water. 
Um, marine communities are subject to these disturbances as well. There's tropical storms that can come. And there's even some major ones too, like a tsunami can happen, which is sort of an, uh, an earthquake that's happening at, in the uh, ocean floor, which disrupts a massive amount of water, which causes a tidal wave to occur. And so that, that, that's rather <laughs> a, a huge disturbance. And so here's my question to you, and I sort of posed this at the beginning. Um, why do high disturbances and low disturbances usually reduce species diversity? And then why is something like an intermediate disturbance, why does this promote species diversity? Let's think about that for a little bit. So what do we mean by high disturbance? Well, a high disturbance would be, like I was just mentioning, like a tsunami. <laughs> That's a high disturbance. When a massive tidal wave comes in and absolutely hits the, the, the land and obliterates, sort of like a, uh, a nuclear uh, warhead would obliterate and completely destroy everything. And so that's going to eliminate species diversity. So when something's really, really intense, high disturbance, it's going to be harmful because it's going to basically kill everything or m mostly everything. But then here, here's something that's a little less obvious. So low level disturbance, why is that not as good? Well, if you're in a community and there's very little disturbance, and, and if the disturbance is very minimal, what happens is that maybe there's some introduced species in an area, and, and uh, if a fire were to come by or some intermediate disturbance, it might eliminate that. Or if there's some competitive vegetation that's growing up a very, very low level disturbance, again, won't be able to eliminate that. And so you might be thinking, well, why intermediate? Well, an intermediate would sort of wipe out some of the competition, but allow most of the species to stay intact. It won't kill a lot of the animals. It'll just sort of clear it up a little bit. And what that does is it allows for sort of these annual grasses and shrubs to grow back, which then provide bio, not, not only biodiversity, but provide primary productivity. Because when, you know, when you think of primary productivity, you can think, well, there's a lot of biomass in these bigger trees, but it's not really able to support a lot of herbivores because the herbivores like to eat sort of fleshy leaves and things like that. So when an intermediate disturbance comes by, it actually increases the primary productivity of an area. And so therefore there's more uh, herbivores that can thrive and then therefore more carnivores can survive and therefore more species diversity. So how about that? So low level is not dramatic enough to make an impact. And so things get sort of complacent, biologically speaking. And then a high level disturbance is too disruptive, but intermediate is just right. <laughs> how about that? So th three bears. <laughs> so here's a little story about a, a major disturbance that happened. Now, you may not have been alive at this time, maybe you were, but back in the, in the summer of 1988, and one of what, what I think is pr maybe one of the crown jewels of, of the United States, which is Yellowstone National Park. So ecologists at around this time, like in the, in the mid 1970s, early 1980s, are very proud of their, their research and they're coming to the conclusion that fire, especially a again, like we we're just talking about, is a disturbance which is actually beneficial to forests. And, and especially, uh, we're, we're tuned into this in our national parks because we have the Park Service, which is trying to manage these protected areas. And so we want to make sure that we're doing everything possible and nature's way is always best. And so guess what happens? It's very, there's a drought going on and there's, a, there's some lightning strikes. And so there's some big fires that are starting in Yellowstone National Park. And then it's sort of like the perfect storm. Coincidentally, there's also a couple fires in the other parts of the park that are started by humans. And I don't really recall what the, the reasons were, maybe a campfire or something like this. And so it's starting to get the attention of the Park Service, starting to get the attention of the, the public in general, and it's starting to make the news. Because as these fires are are happening in Yellowstone, you know, people are really sensitive just because it's our park. We don't want to see it get burned down. And there's also development. There's, there's lodging there and there's homes uh, that are in danger. And so how do you like this? The fire 
is building and building and building. And so you get one camp that's saying, ah, we've got to put out the fire. And so these are all the, the companies and hotels that, that make a, a living off of Yellowstone National Park. But then the Park Service and the naturalists, the biologists are saying, hey, wait a minute. You know, this is a test of our, of our metal. This is a test of our commitment. We know, and there's no question, that fire is essential in forests. And so we're going to let it burn. It's sort of a natural approach. And so guess what's happening? The fire is burning and burning and burning, and it's getting out of control. I mean, really out of control. At a point where it's becoming a national crisis. I mean, it's on the news constantly. It's on the front page of every newspaper. Uh, the Park Service is under a, a tremendous amount of pressure. It, it, the federal government is involved in this. To, and finally, it's like, okay, this is a, this is, the park is on fire. The, the, our park is burning down. This must be stopped. And so it's a national emergency. And so the, the uh, National Guard is called in. And so the Army is fighting it. It's like every available uh, citizen is out there. It's burning down to, uh, homes and structures. It's completely out of hand. And then and the, you could just imagine the rangers sort of just sitting in a room with their heads, uh, <laughs> you know, their chin in their chest and sitting at a table going, how, why is this happening? Why is the park burning down like this? Uh, this is the, the scope of the magnitude of this is staggering. I'm not sure if you can appreciate it, but all these areas right here are the regions of the park that were burned, uh, it burned all summer long. It couldn't be stopped. It was completely out of control. And so, you know, what, what's going on? I mentioned before that an, an intermediate disturbance was beneficial. So what's happening? Well, it wasn't an intermediate disturbance. If, if you don't mind, I would try to explain this. And so over the last 100 years or so, we've had a policy because we've been trying to protect our, our beautiful national parks, we've had a fire suppression policy. So whenever a fire were to start, we would immediately put it out. And so as a result of that, let's see, let me come back here. As a result of fire suppression, you get like a tremendous amount of buildup of grasses and you also get shrubs and you also get smaller trees. And then again, when things die, let me go here, maybe I'll make a nice brown color. When things die, you get like logs building up. And so as it turns out, the forest floor in Yellowstone National Park was really dense with a lot of fuel. And so when the fire came bah, 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 like this, it burned very, very hot. And so it, it caught all this fuel and then it, it sort of laddered up the smaller brushes to these medium sized trees and then it caught the big trees and basically it totally just burned out of control and it wiped out the entire forest. And again, this is not good. This is a major disturbance and that's going to reduce species diversity. And so you're know, like, okay, fortunately it's a bit of a happy ending. And so now again, disturbances usually have these negative connotations, but as it turns out, this is the, this is the devastation of the Yellowstone fire. But fortunately, at, as the fire finally came to an end, when it, when it started to rain in, in, the, uh, in the fall and in the winter, um, the wildflowers started to come back and the trees started to regrow again. And so it was pretty brutal. But as it turns out, the community is, as it, you know, the stability of, fortunately, the stability the ability to recover from this disturbance was actually pretty good in Yellowstone. And so even a year after, you could see the beautiful lupin coming back like this and the smaller trees are coming back. And again, as it turns out, the fire takes a lot of the nutrient, puts it back into the soil and actually increases the soil quality as well. And so you can see a lot of people like to visit Yellowstone. Maybe you have yourself and you've seen sort of these darkened dead trees, but then in, in between the trees are the new living ones. And so this is an example of secondary succession. So there's these uh, baby trees are responding. They're coming back after a disturbance. The soil's still intact. And as it turns out, the soil's a little bit better afterward. And so what's the moral of this? The moral of this is that we, that we really need to um, pay attention and have more controlled fires. 
to maybe reduce some of that fuel buildup. And so finally, as much as we could do good for those communities, but we, in terms of park management, in the end, human activity, I mentioned that I was going to give you some example of that. Humans can actually be the hand of, of a disturbance as well to a community, and that's usually harmful. I mean, we usually come into areas and we like dominate. We come in and sort of take over an area and for development to build homes and parks and things like this. And so other major disturbances that humans have done is agriculture. Now, I know agriculture is necessary in terms of providing food for, for humanity, but we really have taken a lot of natural land and sort of cleaned it out and we grow just one particular crop. And so in the end, that lower species diversity agriculture. And then likewise, we've done a lot of logging. And when you log a forest, you don't just log trees for the lumber, which we need, again, just trying to keep it, keep it balanced here. We need trees. But when you log a forest, you're also eliminating the habitat for all of the plants and animals uh, that live in that forest. And so species diversity is lost as a result to, to large scale logging. Again, overgrazing. We need cattle and we need sheep and we need pigs and things like this. But again, we the grazing, again, lower species diversity. And then even in the ocean, you're like, well, we don't really dominate the ocean too much, except for the fact that fishing boats can kind of go out there and we hook up these big uh, fishing lines to them with, that are weighted and they actually drag the... The, the bottom of the ocean, it's called trawling, and it actually just wipes out massive, scrapes the bottom of the ocean, and, and it do, it's very effective in terms of its fish catch, but it's also extremely disruptive, and so that's a, that's a pretty huge disruption to the ocean floor. So um, that's our discussion of disturbances. Uh, some of them are good, some of them are bad. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you enjoyed and, and learned something about disturbances in community ecology. Thanks for watching.